Welcome everybody to episode 23 of Lean Whiskey. I'm Mark Graben, who um, is here with you usually and as usual, um, not always, but we're happy we have Jamie Flinchball with us here again today. Jamie, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Glad to, uh, glad to be here uh, in the, the last episode of the year. Yeah, it kind of is uh, the holiday episode. Maybe we're feeling a little bit less festive than we were last year with the holiday episode, but maybe that's all the more reason to try to be a little festive. Although our, our last year's holiday episode, I was in a hotel and uh, we had lots of technical grinches uh, interfering with our episode. So uh, oh, I, at least we'll, we'll avoid that uh, problem this yes. year. Knock on wood. And um, you've got a great little mini lit tree behind you. So for those got my, listen, got my mini tree and some people are probably paying more attention to the wine cellar, but uh, yep. Uh, it's as, as uh, at least from an office standpoint, as festive as it gets, but uh, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. And we're uh, really thrilled uh, to be joined today by uh, a special uh, guest. Deandra Wardell is joining us. Deandra, how are you? I'm doing well. Hi, Mark. Hi, Jamie. Happy holidays. Happy holidays! Uh, great to great to see you. Uh, you've you've done all these uh, these Friday videos on LinkedIn, and and so uh, I feel like I know you through that. I know Mark does more more personally, but I have watched your videos, including one with uh, Lean Webinars. But uh, you know, glad to have you glad to have you on the podcast. Thank you. It's it's good to be here. And Jamie, I follow your work. You're doing amazing things in the lean space. And I have to compliment you. You're light years ahead of me with the holiday decorations. I've yet to put up anything. So I may need to borrow your tree. And then Mark, <laughs> of course, it's always great to, to see and see you and talk to you. So I'm excited about being here with both of you guys this evening. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, we, we, we get to talk about um, lean and uh, kata today. We're going to talk about bourbon. DeAndre has a special connection to bourbon being from the state of Kentucky. <laughs> yes. Yes. One of yeah, uh, a, what, Jamie? Always, yeah, always, always. Yeah, we, we, we know so many people in the lean community, but we, we, we're never sure who actually drinks bourbon or not, um, or who drinks whiskey or not. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it's it's for the most part one of the requirements. So we were we we're sort of thrilled to learn. Uh, I think a couple episodes ago, you started sharing uh, what what you were drinking while we had a live episode, and uh, uh, I think that might have been the the uh, the trigger to get you on on with us, uh, sharing some some Kentucky bourbon. So yeah, yes, yeah, so I'm excited to be here to share the Kentucky bourbon, especially um, since I didn't get to fully celebrate derby this year um so this will be um the first bourbon you know i've had in a while so i'm looking forward to toasting and and talking bourbon with you guys yeah well we're glad to be a good excuse for you thank you <laughs> yeah um you know before we get into uh, the bourbon talk and then we'll get back to lean talk um yeah, uh, Jamie uh, had mentioned, um, you said lean webinars. That's not quite the whiskey talking. It was a lean frontiers webinar. Lean frontiers webinars. Yes, that's correct. Uh, our, our, our good friends, uh, uh, Jim, Dwayne and team uh, who, who have also been, uh, Jim, has, Jim has been a guest with us as well. So I think our, our first, third, uh, third person, uh, three person lean whiskey. Okay. So, Deandra, do you want to share a little bit about that? You know, the, the webinar, you have an upcoming session, sure. if you want to mention. Absolutely. So um, coming up on January 21st with Lean Frontiers, I'll be doing a webinar um, on strategic planning through a continuous improvement lens. And so uh, being a, a huge fan of the kata, and I believe that the kata can be applied to anything um, I'll be talking about how the kata can be applied to strategic planning. And um, I'll be placing quite a bit of emphasis on strategic planning in the nonprofit space. So I'm looking forward to that. That's coming up on January 21st in the new year at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And we'll make sure we have a link to that in the show notes and we can link to the previous kata presentation that you did um, not too long ago. So we hope people will check that out. Okay, thank you. 
And um, I wanted to mention, and in terms of thank yous, like one of my highlights this year has been getting um, to know Deandra here in the second half of the year, um, pretty much, you know, maybe a little before the second half. But um, we, we have talked a lot about lean and we have also talked a lot about, um, you know, topics of, um, you know, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, I, um, we're, you know, we're going to talk mostly lean today, but I'll invite people to go check out a project that we collaborated on. Um, the short version of it is you know, I invited Deandra to, um, I, I was handing over my blog to her for a week and I thought there would be a couple of blog posts and, and this turned into um, a huge project thanks to Deandra's vision and network of um, what she called um, hashtag root cause racism. And so we've, um, did, we did a series of blog posts and we've done some webinars and um, Deandra, you, you want to hear, you know, share your thoughts on it and talk about uh, the website that you have now. Sure. So, you know, that first of all was just a wonderful collaboration. And uh, Mark, I've enjoyed partnering with you and working with you and learning from you. Uh, we've had some very inspiring and very educational conversations. And so I'm just, you know, thankful uh, for our professional relationship and I'm thankful for our friendship. But um, hashtag root cause racism, what started out as a blog series um, has turned into a movement. And um, we now have a website, rootcauseracism.com. The goal for that website um, and for the Root Cause Racism movement is to create a community where those who are part of the continuous improvement community or those who may be relatively new on their, their lean journey, um, but we want it, are sharing how continuous improvement can have a positive impact on some of the things that we see that are, um, you know, as it relates to social injustice and uh, racial inequity and, you know, different disparities and placing a lot of emphasis on looking for ways to improve um, structural racism or dismantle structural racism in the space of healthcare, education, government, and economics. And so, um, Looking forward to, we have some really exciting things that will be taking place in the new year um, where we'll be um, really making an impact. And uh, some of the goals that we have is, you know, to generate scholarships um, for, you know, people who are pursuing degrees in the fields of education and healthcare. So a lot of good things going on. And it's, um, it's some really rewarding and fulfilling work uh, with some really great people. Yeah. On the website is www.rootcauseracism.com. That's something Deandra put together, what, like two months ago, right? Well, about two months ago when we did our second blog series, uh, When Brothers Meet at Gimba. Yeah. Okay. So thank you again for collaborating on that. We hope people will go um, check that out and kind of think through some of these issues from a perspective of um, lean problem solving and systems thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, systemic problems are... Um, not easy to diagnose and solve. There's no single magic countermeasure, but we're going to keep working at it. Absolutely. And Mark, uh, I think, you know, no, plenty of people generate lots of content in the lean space, but, but no one really generates as much collaborative uh, content in the lean community uh, uh, compared to you. Um, but but you may have finally met your your match you know, with Deandra with <laughs> with the amount of uh, collaborative content that that she and and the colleagues she's pulled together have started to generate in a in a in a very rapid fashion. Um, so which which is just uh, you know just brought a whole lot of new voices um, out into the open, which is is really cool. Yeah. Well, I, I will say that uh, Mark has really. Um, set the standard of collaborative content and a lot of the work that I do, I, I call myself modeling myself after Mark Graham. And of course I can't keep up with him. I, I've decided to stop trying, but um, you know, a great lesson taken from him is, you know, there's no I in team and it's great to hear from other voices and other, you know, people from other perspectives. And, um, and it's, and it's, it's just a great learning experience. And some of the people who we've, um, invited to participate in this work. They are from the continuous improvement community, you know, have a long history in practicing Lean Six Sigma and their fellow Kata geeks. And then there are those who are brand new on the journey and um, everyone has had some really great content, great input and great information to share. 
And um, yeah, I, I get accused of being a content machine and Deandra jokingly and with a smile accuses me of being a robot. But see, if I was a robot, I wouldn't be drinking bourbon. That would probably be bad for my circuits. That is true. That is true. <laughs> so there you have proof, Deandra. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's one data point. <laughs> <laughs> it does compute. Right? Yeah. Um, so before um, you know, we talk about whiskey and um, we're kind of bouncing back and forth between serious topics and fun topics here. Um, I wanted to take a minute here just to um, have a moment of uh, reflection in honor of somebody that we've lost this week in the lean community. And he's somebody... Um, I had the honor of learning from, and I consider him a mentor, and uh, that is Norm Bodak. Um, he passed away. He was 88 years old, and uh, boy, I mean, he, I never heard him talk about retirement, and he was working up until the day before he passed suddenly. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, of all the things to appreciate about Norman, you know, I, I only wish to have half as much energy and curiosity as, um, as he demonstrated well into his 80s. You know, I've known him for uh, going, not, you know, maybe almost 15 years, and he was not slowing down at all. So I just want to take a minute um, to, to remember Norman and, and just have a moment for him. Well, and you, you talk about people who have, you know, generated collaborative content, right? I mean, he, he had numerous, you know, numerous co-authors along the, the years, but, um, but perhaps more importantly, brought, brought voices into particularly the American community um, uh, in, in, in great volume, right? Some of the, the most Im important authors in the lean community, he, uh, he, 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 published and, and translated and, and brought them into, into the United States. And, and those, those books that, that he uh, put so much energy into bringing, bringing out the open was in many ways, the fuel, right? We didn't have a lot of, you know, certainly before there were blog posts and, and YouTube. So this was, this was the fuel that allowed the, the spread of lean early on. Yeah. I mean, these were the books um, that were, translated you know from ono and shingo and this was before the word lean was coined by uh, womack and the other researchers and this is before jeff liker and his books it was before mike rother i um, mean everyone else who's you know continued to build on our knowledge and, and our understanding and you know norman brought um, the harada method to people with a lot of passion the last 10 years mm -hmm. and harada being another japanese um coach he had recently met um, I can't think of the name right offhand, but he had recently met um, a, a Japanese CEO coach who he was very enamored with. And, you know, Norman had a gift for finding ideas and people and then really enthusiastically um, helping share those people with the world. Mm -hmm. What I remember and appreciate and respect most about him is just his, his philosophy and his demonstration of respect for people. Um, you know, with all of the great work that he produced, uh, to me, that was just one of the common themes of everything, just the importance of, you know, valuing the people, showing respect for the people who you work with. Um, and, and you could just see that was a, a key part of his commitment um, and his love for the work that he did. Yeah. Well, thank you, Deandra. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so maybe just a quick toast to Norman. To Norman. So we are having that little sip and, and we're, we're toasting Norman. So I guess we can transition um, into um, whiskey talk. Um, so of course, we're going to focus on Kentucky. Absolutely. As our guest, it would be rude not to, right? Yes, yes. Uh, since she you're probably from, wonders why we, uh, why we call it lean whiskey if we had other states and countries even represented uh, uh, since she... She uh, represents Kentucky so well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited when I first um, learned that I uh, was <laughs> on this podcast. And of course, you know, being from Kentucky, 
and, you know, a whiskey and a, a bourbon girl. So I have been looking forward to this for weeks. So I can't wait to share with you guys what I'm drinking this evening. Well, so with that, you're, you're our guest today. We, we should let you go first. Okay, sure. So I have, I don't want my virtual background to mess everything up. No, we can see it. it. Okay, good. I'm trying to do like they do on the, the, the influencers when they're showing product, put my hand behind it. Oh, but it's called, it's called Bro Brothers. And um, it's three brothers who actually pr um, produced this fine bourbon whiskey. And they have, you know, those little characters or their pictures on the front of the bottle. It's, it's really cool. And, um, you know, this, this, and it has some other um, graphics and images on here that are reflective of where the bourbon is distilled, which it's distilled in my hometown, Louisville, Kentucky. Woo woo, shout out for Louisville. <laughs> and, um, and it is the first um, black owned distillery in Kentucky. And then, like I said, it's, it's based right in, in Louisville. And what I think is neat, the name of it is sort of um, a play on the brothers' last names. They're actually three brothers, the Yarborough brothers. And so they mm -hmm. they call it Burrow Brothers. And it's, it's really neat. So um, this came heavily recommended from my brother-in-law who is just has the best taste and everything as it relates to bourbons. And I said, I want a good bourbon. And he's like, this is the perfect one. So it's, it's, it's really nice. And that's and bro, B R O U G H. And their website Correct. is growbrothers.com. Correct. Correct. Uh, I haven't heard of that one yet. So thank you for sharing that with us. I'm certainly going to keep my eyes open for it. Yes. Yeah. I, hadn't, I don't know. If I hadn't had it either. either. It, and it's and it's, it has a really nice like you know, just a really nice smell, really nice flavor. And then I don't know if you can see it or not, but my glass has an etching of the state of Kentucky in it. Okay. Oh, nice. So I'm trying to really represent. Home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And are, are you drinking yours with some ice and some water, or just just some ice? So being a a, a true Kentucky bourbon girl, it's ice. And I always like um, just a twist of lemon. Oh. Gives it another flavor. Cool. Yeah. So what are you gentlemen having? Jamie? Sure. I'll, well, let me, let me start with my pregame. <laughs> um, so I, I, I had Kentucky bourbon barrel um, peppermint porter. Wow. Uh, this, this is uh, something I, I was uh, uh, stocking up a little bit for the the holidays and I saw this. I, I've I've always liked Kentucky bourbon uh, a bourbon barrel. It's it's you got to be careful. It's eight eight point two percent, so you've uh, got to be careful with this. But peppermint porter, I thought that's a, that's a nice holiday, and uh, wow, really good, um, really good stuff. So that was my pregame. Um, I, I, look, I'm skeptical of the peppermint thing when it comes. To I was beer. too. Like, I'm thinking of the state farm commercial of like, that sounds hideous. <laughs> it, it's not something you would normally think. And, and I, I probably wouldn't drink two in a row and I only bought a four <laughs> pack uh, to be honest, but, but you know, I, I had to try it and I, I was, I was surprised how much I liked it. It was, okay. it was really good, but good. that was just, that was just in bourbon barrels. Um, so my actual, my actual uh, bourbon choice is will it uh, straight Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky Straight, uh, and um, in this unnecessarily decorative uh, pot still looking bottle. Um, yeah, it's a very. It is. It, it, it's very unnecessary. It looks great on the shelf. Um, kind of, you have to be careful when pouring with right. the, the giant the giant neck. But um, yeah, it's a fantastic uh, bourbon from the Willett family, uh, fifth generation distillers, and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm neat. Um, quite a good, quite a good taste, quite smooth. Not, not a lot of, not a lot of burn. Um, great on the, the nose on the front end on the back end without, without, without a, a harsh aftertaste. And this is a, you know, I always try to distinguish between my drinking whiskeys and my, my sipping tasting whiskeys. And this is a, this is a taster. This, this one you want to enjoy every sip. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I love Willet. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively reasonably priced. Um, I've had yep. a chance to go visit the Willet Distillery. I believe, yeah, I think it's one of the few remaining family-owned mm -hmm. distilleries that has not been gobbled up by one of the huge right. conglomerates. I mean, there are startup, you know, privately held, um, sure. smaller distilleries. Um, I, it's it's off in the other room. I've got a bottle um, of the the Willet Family Reserve Rye, which I, I have that as well, and it's quite good. Pretty hard to find, and I suddenly started finding it on the shelves here in California. So I, uh, I snapped up a bottle and um, have really been enjoying that. So um, I, in fact, uh, back uh, in Texas, I've got a 175 of the Willet bourbon and it's still shaped like that. And it, <laughs> it's like pouring out of like a really difficult to handle wine decanter because it's just, yeah, it's a very right. heavy base and a very long neck. Um, Found that at the store a couple of years ago and snapped that up, but not just for sure. Yeah. Like drinking it. No, no, absolutely. But it's it, it. You know, you have to be careful about how you arrange your bottles because it takes up a lot of space with big base. But um, uh, yeah, worth worth uh, worth having on the shelf. Um, and uh, always always good when I'm when I'm looking for something. I'm just going to have a, a single pour of and 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 really make the most of every sip. Um, Probably along with Glens Creek, this is one of my my current favorites uh, in in terms of taking my time with. Yeah, well, I'm gonna whiskey geek out for a second here. Like, the, the, can hold the bottle up again, Jamie, for those who are watching on YouTube, because it is such a wide bottle. Like when that starts getting low, I would start worrying a little bit about oxidation more yeah. so than a taller, narrower bottle, depending on how long you've had it. So that might be one that might be worth pouring into a, a different bottle once that gets much lower. But yeah, it, 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 it either that or it, or once it gets a little lower, it won't last much longer. That's the other, <laughs> that's the other option <laughs> always. Yeah. My, my goal over Thanksgiving was to not open anything new and to work on the stuff that was kind of close to empty because actually I did have, I've never run across an, an oxidized whiskey before, but I had a little bottle. It was part of a travel set, you know, tra uh, airport tr um, little um, sampler set of Johnny Walker mm -hmm. um, scotch. And one of those, there were 200 milliliter bottles to begin with, and it was maybe half full still and a couple years old. And I poured it and I don't know if like the cork in the bottle was not a very good seal. It was awful. It was hideous. It was like tea that had spoiled. It didn't even... Mm have any sort of alcohol character to it anymore. And that mm. got dumped out. Yeah. Okay. Now you said you had a goal of not opening new bottles that made it sound like you weren't successful. Uh, no, no, I think I achieved that goal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just checking. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty goal driven. <laughs> <laughs> if I had failed, I wouldn't have beat myself up over that. But. No, no. Or, or or you could have done a podcast about that as your next favorite mistake. As a mistake, yeah. That was, that was maybe a whiskey storage mistake. <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly sounds like it. Yeah, I don't, I, I, you know, there's easy solutions to this, but I don't tend to put them in decanters a lot, even though I have two or three, just because I forget what's in the decanter. Like I said, there's an easy solution to that. Jamie, get, just, get the 5S label maker out, man. I know, I know. <laughs> it's... It's so easy to solve, but Come on. I, I, I tend to pour something in and then tell myself I'll remember what what's in there. And I, I just never do. So yeah, easy to solve. Just, just uh, probably need to use the decanter a little more. Yeah. All right. So then I'll go next. I am drinking and here, I'm going to put, there we go. I've got a Christmas. That's oh, super festive. On my glass. I can still drink that without, okay, that's not getting in the way. Um, so I am drinking, I, I was um, really happy to find um, a bottle of this a month or two ago out here in California. This is Barton 1792 full proof, not foolproof. And I don't like using that phrase when it comes to lean. I don't say foolproof. I say mistake proofing, but this is, this is full proof. Um, it was, so it's been hard to find because of the old Jim Murray whiskey Bible. He named this world whiskey of the year in the 2020 book. And then when that happens, the whiskey becomes really hard to find. Yep. So it is what they call a high rye bourbon. 
Uh, it's supposedly 75% corn, but then 15% rye. Mm -hmm. And the remainder is barley. Uh, the full proof, and it's funny, they don't call it barrel proof. It may have been slightly mm -hmm. proofed down, but it's still, it's 62.5%. Okay. So um, it is, uh, it's a serious bourbon. It, it, it doesn't taste like such a high proof. So like some of the Glens Creek mm -hmm. or Garrison Brothers, mm -hmm. that can be really high proof. It's just got a really rich, um, uh, kind of spicy flavor. So this is a, a good um, fall whiskey. But um, Barton um, so, uh, was in the news in 2018. I forget if we ever talked about this in a Lean Whiskey podcast, Jamie. They had um, a warehouse collapse right. in 2018. Um, I don't know if I don't think Rick House is meant to imply rickety, but they yeah. they had a collapse, and thankfully nobody was hurt. Oh, that's good. Uh, some whiskey was lost, but, um, you know, people can go see pictures and, and read about that. Maybe we'll put that in the show notes too. Um, so how do you error proof that? Well, yeah, build uh, better, better rick houses, um, for, for starters. Uh, I guess it depends on the root cause. Um, but yeah, that's certainly a shame. We've seen fires, uh, of course, uh, right next door to, uh, to Glens Creek. Um, you know, David was posting pictures of, of the fire at the Rick house, you know, right next door to his, his own. That was, uh, um, uh, that was sad to see. 1792 is, yeah, I, 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 the small batch, which is much cheaper, uh, well, I don't know, much cheaper, but certainly cheaper is, uh, one of my go-tos and I've, I've had the, the, uh, the full proof before, but, but before, before it, it, it got, it named its, uh, the accolades when it was easier to find. So it's been a, it's been quite a while since I've had it, I think probably several years. Yeah. And, and normally I think it would be about $50 suggested retail. I think I paid a bit of a Jim Murray liquor store, marked it up a little bit premium. I, I think I paid 70, which didn't seem outrageous. It is really nice. Though. Yeah. I'm gonna enjoy yeah. It. It's, it's not, like I said, the, the small batch is, I think, in the 30s. Mm -hmm. I can't remember for sure, but that's that's uh, easier just to pour or mix, and you're probably not going to mix that a lot um, at, at at 80. But it's a uh, yeah, a little more expensive. But as as you said, it's pretty good all the way through the all the way through the sip. Yeah. So that is, I guess that's whiskey talk. Unless DeAndre, do you have anything else that you want to add about? being from Louisville and, and representing Kentucky when it comes to, uh, to bourbon? Well, the, the only thing I have to add is that, you know, bourbon is just, you know, it's a key staple in Kentucky and, um, you know, just fond memories of family get togethers and, um, you know, college, university, homecoming events and definitely derby events. Um, bourbon is the common theme, but and of course we all drink responsibly, but, <laughs> um, it, it, it certainly adds to the festivities and, and the fun and the memorable occasions for everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be able to, to share a bourbon, you know, with you two and, you know, happy holidays and you guys are making, you make this fun. <laughs> and hopefully we can, well, I think we can do this together in person at some point in 2021. Absolutely. C certainly. And it's, it's, um, you know, I, I think, uh, the, the point you make is, you know, this is best when enjoyed with family and friends, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's, it's really the spirit in which Mark and I started this, this podcast, which mm -hmm. was, let's enjoy a drink together and, and the conversation that goes with it, um, right. uh, which was which the whole point. We're glad to share that with uh, both the listeners as well as, as well as the guests that come and join us. Um, so in the spirit of, of the conversation that goes with it, Right. This is still lean whiskey. And uh, so so we wanted to get into some some lean topics. Uh, we've already kind of covered a, a couple in the intro, but <coughs> Kata is certainly a big a big one for you. Um, uh, you do webinars on it, you, you, you speeches on it, uh, use it in your practice, use it with nonprofits. Uh, uh, really cool. So we we, we grabbed a, an article on, on Kata from lean.org, our, our friends at the Lean Enterprise Institute. Um, 
mm-hmm. uh, improve continuously by mastering the lean kata and, and seemed like a good topic for us to talk about, about in terms of, uh, you know, we're not going to turn this into an educational, you know, step-by-step on kata for that. Go, you know, go watch a webinar. Uh, right. um, but, but talk about some of the lessons and some of the, the key points in which, in which uh, kata is experienced from, from different, different perspectives. Yeah, and we should mention also maybe the article uh, was co-authored by Rose Heathcote and Daryl Powell. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, De- DeAndre, I, I, w- I do want to ask this because I'm, I'm sure you've probably said it in some speech, but, but how long have you worked with Kata as a, as a methodology for lean? Um, so when I think, it feels like it's been all my life, but in reality, I, I would say it's been, um, goodness, for at least the past five to seven years. And I, I first discovered the kata. Um, this is when I worked at a, um, a printing and packaging company. And um, one of my team members, one of the black belt, um, one of the black belts who worked with me, um, Vero- avid reader, um, his name is Mike Jones. And I think, you know, you got Mark, I know you've heard me yeah. talk about Mike before, um, came across this book and he says, you know, what we've been talking about in terms of how to deploy lean, um, I, th- I think it, it warrants reading the Toyota Kata. So I read the book and it's just like, just all these lights clicked on, all the dots started to connect. And so um, I went to my first Kata Con and I took advantage of some online training that was offered by uh, Jeff Liker, but it wasn't until I began to experience the kata as a learner. And I was really fortunate in that my first kata coach, and she continues to be my kata coach, Tracy Defoe, um, is one of the greatest in, in, in this space. And um, what, I, what the kata really helped me realize, and again, I'm not gonna do a speech, we're not gonna do a big lesson or anything, um, is that it really helped me to become a better listener and it helped me to become a better leader. And it freed me up from thinking that I had to have the answers to everything, not only in work, but in life. And um, it helped to, um, you know, when you're, when you're a child, you have just, just this natural curiosity where you want to go and learn and you want to see and you want to, you know, you feel like you're invincible. And so as a result of starting to practice Sakata, and then especially practicing it as a, as a coach, um, it really has been rewarding watching others, you know, regain that spirit of curiosity, not being so intimidated by the unknown or some big, huge um, problem that they're trying to solve or some big goal that they're trying to accomplish because it kind of really helps to, to frame things, break things down to what's the next smallest step you can th- take Yep. And then it builds in that, you know, helps you to start practice thinking scientifically so that you can act scientifically. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons I, you know, I apply it wherever I go, the nonprofit work I do, um, you know, when I've worked in the manufacturing space, because I just see uh, how it can help, how it can help people and how it can help people develop new skills and you know, overcome whatever they feel like may be intimidating or too overwhelming. Yeah. I mean, that's the key, the, the, the people development mm-hmm. that comes from coaching people through problem solving, through their own problem solving. Right, right. right. Yeah, and that's, you know, I, I think when you look at, um, you know, a, a lot of people that have studied Toyota, of course, Toyota doesn't actually, you know, really practice the kata as a, as a, a systematic tool or methodology, mm-hmm. but there's always a difference between the artifacts that people would capture in books and, and, and relate and training. And then the, the thinking behind the tools and methods, which was always, you know, what, what I was always seeking my, my, myself. And, and those have been articulated and through different mechanisms, different perspectives. And this was, you know, simply one way to articulate the thinking behind the tools and artifacts, right? Mm-hmm. The, the problem solving thought process and, and the, you know, fundamentally, you know, I always believe that all, 
you know, lean is mostly about problem solving and coaching is mostly about problem solving. And, Mm -hmm. and, and so this is a way to uh, stumble into the unknown, but, you know, with structure, with guidance uh, and, and, and with, with purpose. Um, So, you know, they, they, in this article, uh, which, which was, you know, it's always nice to see people take, take these things and try to build as a, as a framework. And, Mm-hmm. And this was this is certainly what this article was was meant to do in part. But uh, yeah, one of the quotes was the the only secret to Toyota is its attitude towards learning, right? And so mm-hmm. I, I always look at problem solving, and and I, I see people approach it not as a learner, but as a knower, mm-hmm. and and that's when it usually fails. I don't care mm-hmm. if you have seven steps, if you have ten steps, if you have four boxes. I don't. I don't. None of that matters as much as are you approaching behaviorally problem solving as a learner, um, and and lean as a learner. Just approach your improvement as a learner. So um, you know this was something that always a- appealed to me. You know early on when we were uh, even starting the journey almost thirty years ago at at, at Chrysler, we were simultaneously launching the Chrysler operating system. We also happen to be engaged with the Society of Organizational Learning. And in, in some ways, the work was disconnected. Um, but I was really seeking ways to, to find how, how, it, how it connected. Mm-hmm. Um, the Society of Organizational Learning was all about a learner's mindset, but was really weak on the practical application and the what are you going to do with it, whereas Lean was especially back then, way too tools and application oriented and not learning oriented enough. And we've come a long way in the last 25, 30 years of, of the understanding of lean. But that, that attitude towards learning was, uh, you know, I think, I think paramount to what distinguishes their problem solving from what many practice it as. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was just going to add that quote that Jamie read about the secret to Toyota and its attitude toward learning. That was um, Isao Yoshino, who worked for Toyota almost 40 years. And I'm going to hold up um, the book that Katie Anderson wrote um, with a lot of the lessons and stories from Mr. Yoshino, um, the book Learning to Lead, um, Leading to Learn. Um, I, I recorded recently, it's going to release in January, an episode of My Favorite Mistake with um, Katie and uh, Mr. Yoshino. And he, he told a story, it's in the book about making a mistake early in his days at Toyota and how that culture you know, and, and the reaction of, le- of his leaders taught him that learning had to take priority over blaming or shaming or punishing you know, when it was an honest um, human error. Mm-hmm. I think that's an important part of the learning dynamic. It's, it's, it's incredibly important to the learning dynamic. And, you know, Rose had several memorable quotes in the article. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you're going to um, share the link to that article in, in the, the podcast notes. But, you know, something else that, that stood out is two things that she said that stood out. Um, you know, talking about preparing the learner for the extraordinary as they progress from known to known, you know, versus facing the unknowns and over unknowns. Mm -hmm. And then she talked about, you know, solving complex problems requires reflectful, insightful questioning. And, you know, I think that's one part of um, the Toyota Kata that, that I appreciate the most that, you know, you have a starter Kata and that's teaching you the pattern, teaching you the steps, you know, you have your five question card, you know, the questions that you ask, but that's just a way to get started. And ultimately, you know, as a learner, um, you want to test what you think you know. You, um, those unknowns, you don't want to be intimidated by them. You want to go and figure out whatever it is. Well, what is it that I don't know? Well, how is it that I can learn? Who do I need to contact? What article do I need to read? What experiment do I need to run? And even as a coach, you know, the coach doesn't have all the answers. The goal of the coach is to get the learner to to think and to think deeply and not be so sure about what it is that we think we know. And so, you know, as I was reading through that article, it just took me back to a number of coaching cycles that I had with Tracy that, you know, we would start with a coaching card. And um, when we got to question three, and and I sometimes don't think enough emphasis is placed on that question. And that's where you're asked about, you know, what are the obstacles 
that are preventing you from reaching your target condition. And then, you know, you dig a little deeper to find out what happened during your last experiment. And it ends with, you know, well, what did you learn? And there are times when, you know, you have to probe a little deeper where the learner has to do more reflection, reflecting, the coach has to ask more questions. And that's all part of that learning process and, and building that skill and beginning to, um, you know, think about, you know, the scientific way about, you know, improving a process or making a change or building a habit or developing a skill. So, you know, one of the things that, um, that you know, a, a point that I took away from the article uh, from Rose and then, like I said, from my own experiences, yes, it's great to start with these questions on the car, but it's not expected to stay with the script forever and a day. You know, as you begin to become comfortable, you want to probe, you want to go deeper. And it's about that learning experience and building on that and, and sharing that learning with others. That's the difference between, or that's why it's called the starter kata instead of calling it the forever kata. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, and, and the same thing happened with, you know, and it's, it's not Mike's fault. I'm just using this as a, to illustrate when Mike had his first book out, which is Learning to See, and, and he published eight steps that you use to, uh, you know, drive your improvement in your in your value stream map, um, you know, people would use it and expect the answer to pop out. And, you know, he and I sat down you know, sometime after his book was published in, in Michigan mm -hmm. and had a had a conversation over coffee. And, and one of the, you know, he, he didn't see all the problems with this because he was always in the room when he got to observe it because he would make sure that you went beyond those, you know, that routine went beyond that, that rigidity and, and thought deeper. Right. And, and so when people took it as, Oh, this is the recipe, that's when they failed. And it's the same thing is true with questions. Um, you know, they, they don't always pop out the magic answer. Uh, but they, they start your thought process of how to ask good questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I happen to be, I'm working on my, my next book, which is a topic for another episode, but, mm -hmm. but I, I really distinguish, I think people need to learn how to ask good questions. Um, cause I, I'll watch many leaders that I coach and, and, you know, they'll, they'll start asking questions cause like, oh, questions means I'm coaching, but they're really advocating points, you know, disguised as a question. Uh, or just seeking information, none of which are coaching questions. And so I, I really like to distinguish between guiding questions, which are questions that help people figure out their next step, and then reflection mm -hmm. questions, which are questions that help them learn from it. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a thousand and one different questions you can come up with in each bucket. Uh, and that's why the, the questions of the, the, the starter kata will, will never be enough. Mm -hmm. But it is it is putting you on the pathway to learn how to ask better questions uh, from an improvement standpoint and a learning standpoint. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we tried to emphasize that learning, you know, Jamie wrote a chapter, um, you know, and the, the, I'm going to hold up. I'm the guy who holds up books today. Um, <laughs> our, our, book hold up this. our book practicing lean available now as a stocking stuffer um, proceeds go to the Louise H. Batts patient safety foundation. But the subtitle to the book is intentionally a bit of a mouthful. Um, learning how to learn how to get better, better, right? So it's not just learning how to learn, it's learning how to learn better. It's learning how to improve better. And, you know, I think that, that you know, embracing that is more difficult than asking a consultant that's just, oh, just come in and tell me how to do it. Mm -hmm. Give me the improvement cookbook and we'll follow it. I'm like, well, okay. You, you, you don't really learn how to cook unless you're, you know, they, they always teach you in cooking classes, taste what you cook. Right. You've got to be adaptive and flexible and don't just follow some recipe that was that, that you were taught. Right. So I don't have a book to hold up, <laughs> but I do have one of my journals where, you know, I capture a lot of thoughts around, you know, different things around, you know, as, as I'm reading books and, and different things about lean thinking and um, scientific thinking. And of course, you know, like I said, the cod is near and dear to my heart. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, but, you know, Mark, you know, that analogy you just used about cooking, you know, sure, there's a recipe you can follow. You can take a cooking class, but you learn by doing and having those experiences and reflecting on, you know, 
I put half a teaspoon of salt and maybe I should have just put, you know, a fourth a teaspoon. Yeah. And it's from, you know, reflecting and figuring out what you learn that you build on that. And so, you know, um, my interaction with Akata, you know, I see it in everything, not just in manufacturing procedures. And, and that's when um, I remember the very first time I participated in a vision board workshop and as the facilitator was sharing the steps of how we were going to build our vision board, everything she was saying, I, all I could hear were the steps of the kata. And, um, you know, and that's one of the reasons I, once I started doing vision board workshops, that I incorporate the kata in it because, again, it's, it's, it's not a recipe that you just stick with and you, you don't, you know, adapt or you don't, you know, modify it. But, it's a good starting place for whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, and as a manager, it would, it helped me to become, like I said, a better listener because it wasn't about, Oh, let me just jump in and ask this next question to sound like I know what I'm talking about, or let me try to guide my team in this path where I want them to go to get this result that I expect they were going to achieve. But it really made me step back and listen and help me realize that other people have great ideas, other people have the opportunity to solve problems and make things better, you know, what can I learn from listening to them and asking them questions along the way? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, and that, uh, so that, that ties back to, you know, one of the quotes that I, I, I captured was kind of the point of the article, which is where they were, where, where they were headed Mm -hmm. uh, talking about some of the gaps that they see and people using it um, to this, this cooking analogy. And, and uh, so the, the quote is, as such, we suggest a need to supplement the improvement and coaching kata, the two katas described in, in, in Mike's book, with a third type of kata, the learning kata. Um, and and, and yeah, I, don't want to, I, dis, I, I agree with the premise, I disagree with the conclusion, in, in the sense that, um, you know, first, if you if you see a problem with structured routine, then adding a third routine probably is a disconnect for me. But more importantly, it's it's that is the spirit of the cod is missing rather than a third kata, right? So so you can use the kata as a as a rigid tool and and practice, or you can use it as a guide, use it as a thought process, use it as a provoking practice and make sure that regardless of whether you ask the right question, you're, you're, you're bringing out the, the, the intuition along with the, the learning along with the analytical, right? All of that has to come, come through the, the whole process. And so, you know, I would say any kata that is not included learning along the way is probably a, a failed practice, mm -hmm. not, not, a, not a, something missing from the structure itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, oftentimes, and, and, you know, we just see this in the work that we do, you know, people are looking for a tool, they're looking for a recipe, they want something to follow that's going to bring those instant results. And, you know, the kata is about, you know, it's a teaching method, it's a practice routine um, to help people to get in the habit of scientific thinking. And that scientific thinking becomes scientific you know, doing. Um, in the last organization I worked with them, um, they were relatively new on their continuous improvement journey. And so I didn't introduce tools. Um, I was very careful about that. I wanted them to understand the thinking. And I would start out with two basic questions. You know, what, what problem are we trying to solve? Yeah. And then whatever it is we're trying to solve, well, what is our, wouldn't it be great? What is the optimal you know, condition or, or, you know, way that we expect this process or whatever it is, or this service we're providing, what do we see as ideal? And what I began to, um, to observe is that in meetings, that became a question that people started asking, well, what problem are we trying to solve? What is our, wouldn't it be great? And it was after that, then it, it then the tool, the, you know, the type of tool that was needed would come forward and we could talk through that. And I think, um, you know, just focusing more on, and like I said, getting people to think and think about what problem it is that they have and what incremental steps they can take to solve it and, you know, ask those deeper questions and the reflective questions. I think, you know, it's, that, that's what the kata is about. Yeah. The, I mean, you know, the one other thing in the article 
Four simple words, and let's keep amplifying this and repeating it as much as we can. Lean is about learning. Yes. And I think too many people have associated, um, for one reason or another, lean with cost reduction or efficiency and like only those things as opposed to the learning. And like on that note, the other day, I'm also a guy who's going to plug other podcasts guy today. Um, I had a chance to interview um, Hide Oba, who was, the, who was one of the sons of Hajime Oba, um, who passed away also a month or so ago. The famed, he was often referred to as Mr. Oba, um, guy from Toyota. Um, you know, it was pretty legendary for, you know, for working in the U.S. and, and beyond. And his son, who worked with him in, you know, basically lean operations management, TPS practice, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but the spirit of, of what he said was that TPS is it's really just problem solving, identifying problems and working towards solving them in iterative ways. Mm -hmm. And that's powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems too simple to be powerful, but. Well, and that iterative part, I think, is, you know, what, what's important from a learning standpoint. Um, you know, you, you take A3, which has the same problems as a, as a Toyota copied uh, methodology where, um, you know, I'll see people start in A3 and they write down everything they already know. And it's like, well, you know, you just start filling out the blocks with all the information you know. And it's, like, well, it's not the information that you knew that was hurting you. It's the information you didn't know. Right. And, you know, I'll, I'll see people fill out an A3 and they'll do it with great precision and, and, and with great data. But what I'll notice is, and this is always what I one of one of my, my indicators is they 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 go through from step A to Z straight through. Right? This step A, B, C, D, all the way through to Z, they, they go through the process in a linear fashion and not iterative. And you know, when I see that too often in an organization, I know they're just treating it like a tool. Mm -hmm. not like a job aid to help them think. And, you know, the, the whole point is problem solving is learning. So if you, if you go through from step A to Z in a straight line, every single time, you're either the best problem solver in the world, or you're not treating it like a learning process, which is more often the, the, the real, you know, the real failure because lean is all about learning and mm -hmm. problem solving is all about learning. Mm -hmm. And our friend, David Meyer, you know, from Glens Creek, He's a whiskey making problem solver as he's iterating yep. and experimenting and learning. And he got that from his time at Toyota. Yeah. And he, he, he'll, he'll, uh, you know, if you go visit his, uh, his, his operation, his, his distillery, um, you, you'll notice it's not a picture of five S right. right? And, and he'll have other people come in and go, Oh, where's all your labels and signs and your <laughs> tidiness and all this. And, you know, it's, it's really a two person operation. It really is, uh, you know, a, a true startup from a, from a distillery standpoint. Um, but, but it's like, well, what problem would that solve? Right. It's uh, yeah. that's, that's his, his, his response is people, you know, he was telling me how people are, you know, challenging him for why he doesn't have better 5S, but there's not a problem there that that solves for him. Right. right. He's, he's, he's problem solving the, the value. And again, with two people, it's, it's really hard for things to go missing. <laughs> um, right. And sure, he could do a better job with 5S, but he's like, that's not the problem I'm trying to solve right now. So, so very much, you know, you go there and if you, if you just stand there and look, you might not see much lean, but if you talk to them, right. it's all lean. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's all learning. It's all experimentation. It's all iterative uh, exploration. And that's, and learning. So that's, and that's, and that's ultimately what the kata is meant to do when used properly, not as a script, um, a starter, right? Is it, it just like the A3, it's a job aid. It's meant to help you get started going down the right path, but it, it, it can't do it for you, right? If it could do it for you, you could just write the code, right? Just <laughs> write, turn it into code, turn it into software and be done. So, so it's, right. it's not. 
some robot could solve your problems for you. Yeah, some robot, robot like Mark Raven could, could handle not, all of all of Lean for you. Not, exactly. A robot. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. We could have a Mark Raven robot that would just come out there and you wind him up and and, and let him go. But you know, Jamie, you, you as you were talking about the distillery and how people come in and they may not think it's five S, and you know that, that that's another thing that that I think we sometimes miss. We can get so focused on introducing tools versus focusing on what problem is it we're trying to solve, what value is it we're trying to bring, and you know, value for the customer, the external customer, and you know, the customer in terms of the employee, the internal customer. And you know, as you focus on you know, solving those problems, making an improvement, you know, creating these wonderful experiences for the customer, the needed tool will surface. And you know, implementing a tool just for the sake of doing it accomplishes nothing. And I think, um, you know, again, it just like everyone has said, it just goes back to learning, and it goes back to developing people and bringing the best out of people. And sometimes I think, um, you know, the the work we do can be overcomplicated, um, and when it just needs to focus on, you know, like I said making things better for people, improving processes. Yeah. I will say Robot Robot Mark uh, did develop, this is an important moment of history, <laughs> he did develop an A3 problem solving tool that uh, required two iPads. Uh, you had to do two iPads and you opened up your folder of iPads and, and you did your A3, but you've got to find an April 1st uh, uh, blog post to find <laughs> that particular product. Uh, okay, I'll have to look from, for that. From, from several years ago. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, I, I wasn't in the mood to do an April Fool's joke <laughs> this year, but yeah, I, I've got a tradition of that on the blog. It was uh, an A3 app that, um, here, well, maybe we'll link to that in the yeah, show we'll, notes. That we'll, was back we'll, have from, to, we'll have to. That was back in uh, 2011, where 2011. now, like, you wouldn't need double iPads. Like, an iPad Pro is enormous, right? The big one. But, still not uh, A3 size, though. You still you probably need yeah. two iPad Pros to get proper A3 size. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that, that was a fun, um, yeah, I had a little robotic coach that would yell at you for jumping to solution. <laughs> now, look, you could, you could create an algorithm for that where, like, if you had this digital A3 and somebody was li literally trying to type in countermeasures before they had filled out anything about the root cause, you could throw up a dialog box and an error message. That's not the most sophisticated coaching. But when it comes down to like, you know, typing a title and making sure we're not framing that as a solution, that's a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could train some AI to do that, but uh, not me. I'm not going to do that. Well, there's a, there is a favorite quote and I, 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 I don't know if I can find it quickly, but, uh, uh, it's from a French mathematician that really treated math and he, and he talked about how math was a, really a combination of analytical and intuition, right? And, and, and so this was a mathematician, right? this is a famous mathematician. And, and so, you know, we talk about being data-driven we talk about being analytical and improvement and problem solving, but only when integrated with our, our intuition and our creativity Right. You put all of that together and, and, and that's that's when it's truly powerful. Mm -hmm. And then if, if I can add a quote while we're adding quotes and this this makes me think about you both. And I'm not just saying this because, you know, we're talking and I'm you know trying to gas you up or anything. But one of the things I, I respect about the work that you both are doing is that, of course, you know, you're both analytical, very heavy data driven, you know, you're the experts in your field. But the other thing, too, is that you genuinely care about the work that you're doing and the people you're working with. And I think that's one of the draws of, of why people follow you and they're interested in the work that you're doing. And, you know, there's one quote that says, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Sure. And I think that's something that, you know, all of us, um, you know, should work towards in the continuous improvement space that, you know, we want people to know that we care. We want what's best for them um, professionally as they're developing. Uh, you know, we want them to have fruitful and meaningful personal lives. And, um, you know, when we focus on that, I believe the other things will come that will 
you know, be the drivers and the goals that we have in business and make sure that our, our customers are delighted with our products and services. I thought, it, I thought the quote was, it doesn't matter how much you know, but people want to know how silly that you'll be with April Fool's show. That, that's not. <laughs> that's the other quote. That's, that's the other quote from the, from the robot series of quotes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. People don't care how much you know, as long as you're right. Um, so. <laughs> well, so speaking about caring about our listeners, it's probably a good uh, good time to to start to head towards wrapping this episode up. So we we uh, respect their time as well. Uh, as we, well we, as we, we have a listener question that we keep kicking down the road, Jamie. We'll we'll get to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, time. we'll we'll have we'll have three new listener questions. Uh, uh, maybe we'll do a whole episode of listener questions uh, yeah. by then. So. Um, yeah, but probably time to wrap up and, and move on to uh, our, 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 our fun closing question. Yeah, so that question is, you know, beyond whiskey, what's the best thing you've had to drink recently? Jamie. Yeah, so all, but besides my, my uh, bourbon barrel peppermint porter. <laughs> um, so so I, I, I used to, especially in the winter, I always used to be a Bailey's Irish cream person. And uh, um my wife uh, took her father and they went to a liquor store to pick up some things for, I don't remember why. Um, but she came back with five farms, Irish cream. And, um, you know, you know, Bailey's, I can get on my Delta flights that I used to be on all the time. Uh, uh, great early morning, uh, uh, starter. I was just, just going to ask, were you that fly? guy? Were you that guy? <laughs> On the 7 a.m. departure that was having a Bailey's and coffee. <laughs> only on the way home. Only on the okay. way home. Okay. Um, <laughs> but this Five Farms Irish Cream uh, was was quite, quite good. Um, way better than, than Bailey's, quite frankly. And uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll have, to, I'll have to make sure I get some more. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great nightcap. It's a great, uh, you know, I'll say brunch drink maybe. Um, but uh, um, I'll definitely be looking forward to getting more of this Five Farms Irish Cream. I'm not sure how small batch they are. I mean, it's called small batch, but I'm not sure exactly. They're definitely smaller than, than Bailey's, um, but very, very, very good. I mean, I, I would, if, if I could, I would rather drink, um, I've had before, Buffalo Trace Whiskey Cream, which is made with bourbon. I have nothing against Irish whiskey, but... The Buffalo Trace um, product is really good if you can find it. And like some of the local Texas distilleries, uh, not Garrison Brothers, but others from the Dallas area do their own whiskey cream. And you can even make your own at home. You can find a recipe online and you can make sure that, you know, there's no chemicals in it. And I don't mean to slander any producer anywhere of any product. I'm not saying there's chemicals in it, but you can know for sure that there's not. And this is why we don't get sponsors. Yeah, that's yeah. We we uh, we 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 take our criticism seriously. So I may, maybe maybe I will have to try making my own. Um, I just have to figure out what what whiskey to use. That's the probably going to be the toughest choice. So yeah, there's your holiday science project. Um, I, I I was going to talk about uh, a cocktail that I had the other night. Um, you know, my wife and I try to support um, some restaurants by doing takeout once, maybe twice a week. And one of the, um, the L.A. restaurants that we did takeout from had um, the option of cocktail pairings to bring home and do the, the final assembly of the cocktail. And they had a drink called, uh, I'll apologize to our Kentucky guest, Deandra. It was called uh, Meet Me in Tennessee, which had um, a Tennessee rye whiskey. Um, it had a spiced ice cube. So I don't know exactly what was in. It was a tall cylindrical ice cube that had a lot of fall, winter spice. Um, there was egg white. Um, I think there were there there might have been a little bit of apple cider in there, or it was just the spice. Mm -hmm. And then it was topped off um, with a, a kind of a layering of some red wine on top. And we enjoyed that quite a lot. So that that's the standout cocktail that I've had recently. You you enjoyed you enjoyed it quite a lot, or you enjoyed quite a lot of it. No, we we had one that we shared, so it okay. was more of the well, that... <laughs> enjoyed it a lot. And I don't know if I, that's one, I don't know if I could recreate, like I, I can make a good Manhattan and other base cocktails, but I don't know the recipe for this one. Sounds complicated. Yeah, it was delicious. Good. 
So recently, um, what did I have that was good? So I've, I've represented my home state mm -hmm. with my bourbon. So I'm currently a resident of Indiana. I live in Indianapolis. And there's a winery here called Cooper's Hawk. And so recently I had a glass of their wine, uh, the Sweet Red, and it was delicious. So you know, I had it with dinner and um, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, good. It's good to drink something that's not whiskey or not bourbon occasionally. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And, 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 and I'll tell you those, those, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say neighborhood, but local wineries, uh, anywhere in the country are, are really getting better and better. Um, you know, really not just producing wine because they can, but taking their, their grape growing seriously and their, their production seriously. And so, you know, I have, I have multiple in my, I'll say backyard and, and, it, and it's nice to, you know, we, we talk about buy local, Right. Um, doesn't always apply to, to, to alcohol, but, but it's nice when it does too. Okay. My, right. my, uh, my local wine in California beats your local wine. I won't yeah. argue with you. It, it, yeah, also, sorry. it also beats the local wine in Texas. So. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, you, maybe not LA wine, but, uh, um, but yeah, California Marvel, knows what they're doing. Yeah. 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 No, California knows what they're doing. Yeah. Um, final question. This is a more of the short answer phase. Um, eggnog, yes or no? And if yes, how? So when offered, I guess, is my how. So <laughs> yeah, I guess the answer is yes. I never buy it because, A, I'm rarely home for any significant period of time before like December 23rd. So I, I don't and nobody else in the house will drink it. So uh, uh, so I never buy it. So I'll say, Sure but usually it has to be offered to me at some other, some other location before, before I, I take a sip. So from eggnog. Absolutely. And it's, um, you know, it's a family tradition that we look forward to. Um, in my adult years, usually at Christmas, my mom and I, we have a, a big slumber party together. And part of that includes um, eggnog and it's, you know, just eggnog out of the carton, but it's, it's fun having eggnog with my mom while cutting up. Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so, uh, uh, I'll, I'll have a little eggnog. I don't really ever really seek it out. Um, I made eggnog once, like this was God, maybe 20 years ago and I must've decided it wasn't worth the effort or the risk or whatever. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think definitely when you say how, I do want to add some whiskey to my eggnog. I'm a fan of that. I think it's appropriate. Um, I almost bought, maybe I should, um, at the grocery store today, bringing it back to Kentucky. It's a pre-made eggnog uh, from Evan Williams, which is one of the, uh, mm. the famed uh, bourbon distilleries in, yep. uh, in Kentucky. I, mean, see, like, I don't know. I like, you know. If you make it at home, you can make sure... You know, you, you talk about tweaking recipes, whether it's a cocktail recipe or whatever. I tend to um, use less, let's say, simple syrup or less sugar mm -hmm. than the recipe calls for. So sometimes I think eggnog, it's delicious, but it's just too sweet and it might still be delicious. It would, might be better if it was a little less sweet. Fair point. I'm not a not an expert by, by any stretch. And I certainly haven't tried to make it my own, uh, make it myself. Like I said, I, I don't even go buy it, but yeah. since I am home, maybe, maybe this year I should. And, uh, um, actually try to enjoy some of it this season. Well, if we're going to make something, Jamie, maybe we can both try to make homemade, uh, whiskey cream and talk about that next time. Interesting, interesting proposal. <laughs> and share the recipe. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, I think that's going to bring us to a close here on um, Lean Whiskey. Um, we invite you to visit our website if this is your first time listening and you want to go hear some of the other episodes or if you want to subscribe. For the future, you can go to leanwhiskey.com. You can spell it the way they do in Kentucky with an, a K-E-Y at the end. You can spell it uh, with a K-Y at the end the way the, uh, the Canadians and the, uh, the Scottish and, uh, and some others do. You can also go to leanblog.org slash lean whiskey, which is actually where that URL forwards to. Yep. And you can uh, also find it on my, my site at jplench.com, lean whiskey. Um, 
uh, find all, all podcasts and then of course follow me on to other, other blog posts and more. Yeah. And uh, uh, Deandra, what about your, your website? You can follow me at DeandraWardell.com. And then for the work we're doing and bringing, you know, equity for all, uh, you can follow us at RootCauseRacism.com. Thank you for mentioning that website and um, that ongoing work again, Deandra. Um, please do look for us. Look for Lean Whiskey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you tend to find podcasts. And, and absolutely, please, please rate us, review us, uh, subscribe, uh, forward, forward the, uh, the post to, to your friends. Um, you know, we, we certainly love reaching new people. And these are the many ways in which that, that whole process has helped and helps other people find, uh, find our podcast. And they can fast forward through the whiskey part if they don't want to hear that. <laughs> I, I don't know why, <laughs> why they would want to do that. But um, Deandra, thank you so much for um, joining us and um, sharing some of your passion for uh, kata. I don't think you used the phrase kata geek today, did you? I'm sure I did at least once. I always use that kata geek. If nothing else, I refer to Tracy Defoe as a kata geek. <laughs> <laughs> so we can be kata geeks, lean geeks, whiskey geeks. Mm -hmm. it's all good so thank you for being here jamie thank you for doing this again always always appreciate always. it and look forward to doing more of these in 2021 absolutely fantastic cheers and happy holidays cheers, cheers. happy holidays happy holidays here's to safe and healthy holiday for everybody absolutely for everyone and i perfectly paced myself to finish my whiskey right then well, I, I could do that too if I really wanted to, but <laughs> I'll take my time with these next couple of sips. <laughs> <laughs>